last year. We had about 600 samples. That sounds about right. And I would know that. <laughs> I'm gonna because it's already done. The, delta the okay. calculation's okay. been made. Will do. I'm going to have to. I'll, I'll do with um, the. Do we get any unexpected associates right uh, on the <laughs> collected coral samples or sponges <laughs> coming in through the website? Wondering if we get unexpected associates on some of these samples. Yeah, you know, sometimes we, we yeah, see things know, like amphipods or small shrimp that come up. Um, with these things, they attach to they're they're kind of attached to the coral or attached to the sponge, and we pick them out afterwards. So all the time we get, um, yeah, unidentified animals. Um, but that's why we have subsampling protocols to make sure that they're properly attributed to their primary sample. So the top side will not be running on this computer, correct? Should not be. Okay. I can't. Nav, uh, double checking, 540 you said, right? 540? Uh, Roger, that's if we're at about okay. 2,000 okay. meters, um, okay. which it looks like we okay. it's yeah. back. It should be. Okay. Let's keep going up. Roger. Let me know when uh, RIV is ready to go. Yeah, not quite. You yeah. want to look at this one or the one in the background, Steve? Uh, the uh, well, uh, not the one in the background. Maybe preferred, um, but I'm actually thinking of also maybe taking a Niskin in this area. Yeah, um, can do. We can do a floating one. Don't have to be particularly positioned. Was that a corallid? Uh, yeah, that we have a hemichorallium down there, and then there's a primnoid. Um, probably Caltrophora down there. You're good, as long as you're, as long as that's not in danger, that's not, I don't mind that. Okay, oh, I thought you said 15. Yeah, yeah, or less. It's, okay. Well, yeah, don't go by that. Come on, that one, in, that one. In okay. the view. I'm trying to keep it slack because the heaves. Understood. It's hard to judge when to come up, I know. It'd probably be more up and down than usual because of the uh, I can feel the bounce so I'll ask you that can come down a bit. Okay. Yep. Okay, tell me if you want to uh, zoom in there a bit. Yeah, so this is a primnoid, possibly Kelptrophora, two brittle star associates. Not a very good angle on it, is it? I, I think we already did look at this one uh, a bit earlier on the launch. Uh, so I'm happy with that idea. Yeah. 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 We okay. can do that sample. We can do the Niskin if you want. Ready for a Niski? Yeah, this is great. Yeah, right around this area. It's not an extremely high density, but there's a diversity here. And I want to make sure we have a sample from the seafloor before we have to pick up off bottom. right there for a second. Okay. Pam, you want to do a, just a quick first for me? Yep. Let me know when. Uh, now would be cool. Okay. Going. Thank you. Okay. That's what I needed. Got it. Okay. I have no 
idea what missed one. It looks like there's two left. Oh, maybe three. There's three left. Missed one. Um, should I go for three on this one, Dana? It looks like three has not been pulled yet. Three has not been pulled yet. Yeah, three's good. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Three has now been All right. Good job. On the flying escape. Okay, Sam. We're okay, ready. let's do Thank it. Thank you. Two zero meters zero six eight, please. Craft is secure. Roger. Zooming in just a smidge. Thank you. Already on it. Roger. It's just real slow. Need to modify that one with an ROS too. Move underway. Are you sure you want an ROS? No, I want to build our own. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Less about the numbers and trying to keep Perk in the middle of the screen with a enough loose tether. Yep. It's hard to define one number because we're in, out, up, down, further, further yep. in. Okay. Need to not run away so fast. <laughs> it's a challenge. Looks like we're stuck in sheet flow land again. <laughs> yeah. Critters don't seem to Maybe like some the pillows here and there. As much, do they? Is it my imagination, Steve, or do they not? Uh, there's not as much biology. biology yeah, in, uh, it's. It, it might just be a how the slope's oriented uh, in this area. It seems like a lot of the attached organisms are, are liking the boulders and vertical faces, so get more verts. Cucumber down in the center. Anemones. And a rillacanthus in the distance. Steve, someone's wondering how tall are these underwater mountains? So we're Do gonna we we're gonna top out at um, about 1,900 meters, uh, which is pretty close to the summit depth for the entire Guillot. Uh There might be a, a very small patch, mm. a bit shallower in the middle. So we're, we're pretty much almost there. Uh, I suspect that you know the last 100 meters or so might be really stretched out. So you'd be covering sediment and going up at a very gentle grade. But we've covered a pretty good distance. Uh, where we start at 20, or 31.66 was on the dive plan. I don't know what the exact depth on bottom was, but we covered a really good distance uh, in this dive. Yeah. 
We observed some really, uh, two zero really zero interesting zero turnover, zero. Um, kind of on the lower end of the what do we call the bathial zone. Mm -hmm. So, the the bathial zone is typically from 200 down to uh, 3,000 meters or so, and uh, the you know we know a little bit about species distributions and within the bathial zone and then you know the bathial zone and shallower. Um, but it's not really clear, you know, it's kind of a blurred transition between kind of the more abyssal fauna, you know, 3,000 meters plus, and then that, that bathial uh, zone assemblage. So this, these are really useful data from a biological perspective about, um, you know, where that transition occurs, you know, which species are most likely to be associated with the deeper depths and uh, which are more intermediate. Mm -hmm. But we also wanted to sample a number of rocks from uh, greater than 3,000 meters where there was a data gap. Um, not only are the rocks hopefully very useful for uh, the volcanic aging, but also for the crust analysis that's going to be done uh, back on shore. Good evening. Hello. So we're about half an hour now in our last half hour of being on the seafloor before we're going to have to come up. We are still climbing, but expected to level off sometime in the next uh, couple hundred meters, maybe, maximum. I had expected this rise to be a bit more um, vertical in places, but it sounds like uh, it's just a steep slope, steep uh, uniform slope. There you get a good pr perspective in the Hercules camera about how steep this is. If you yeah. drop something down there, it won't be coming back anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Are you playing dead? Or you just used all this energy for the week, got his steps in? It's wiggles. Now. We get another two zero meters bearing zero six eight. I think this is our. Uh, not sure. It's very tough to zoom in on here. <laughs> My shine. It really just wants to be left alone. Yeah. Okay. But All right. We'll leave him alone, but I hope we got what we needed there. Can we do a half zoom in this area? Sure. Go ahead, Tim. Just want to make sure I'm not seeing things. Might be sediment. Yeah, it's sediment. I thought this this was a branch here, but it's just sediment on the rock surface. There's maybe a brittle star or a sea star down there. Also very, very tiny, less than 10 centimeters. Okay, thanks, all set. I'm glad we took that last Niskan down 
before we started seeing corals, because I don't know if we're going to see any more at this rate. I'm hoping it's just because maybe the, the slope is a little bit too intense here. Well, uh, really, what would be the other a reason? Lot of outcrops like this one. Uh, stagnant flow. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there's a couple. Oh, what do you think, sparse branch or not sparse um, branch? I think it actually is, if it is a bamboo. Can we take a look at this critter here? Sure. Oh. I got one more jar left. We do. <laughs> I'm might, willing to fill it. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take it. I mean, it only has one branch. Oh, it does, yeah. actually. I think this would be really good. We're going to want to zoom right on the yeah. node region. Yeah. Right. The branch region, sorry. You want to see the angle so you can actually see the branch? Okay, Tammy, you can push it there. Steve, should I uh, be considering stopping the ship? Uh, consider it. All right, fingers on the button. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can keep moving, unless there's a whole bunch of coral up there. Push in a bit more, Timmy. You sure that's not sediment? I don't know what it is. I don't know that off. They're staring really hard. What are we looking for? Uh, looking to see where it is actually branching and how close to the node it would be. It's like perfectly blocked by a single polyp here. I know. Um, Come around if you can't see it there. It's got such thick tissue, it's hard to see. So I think I could see a node there. It looks like it's, to me, Pretty and close to or at the node. Oh, Ooh, there you go. It's just distal. Yeah. Your call. What do you want? I would love to take a sample. Okay, we're gonna do a we're snip. In. Oh, you can hit the stop button. Um, bridge nav, hold position. Yeah. It did pretty much just finish up that move, but hey, they're still a bit ahead of you. I want to take it back. <laughs> Bring it back. Yeah, you can put twenty back. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, Sorry. no worries. Okay. I just can't think in reciprocals. How about two two five zero? I know there should be a reciprocal, but you're not <laughs> forced to do math. Reverse, reverse. <laughs> two three zero. I'm doing it. I'm doing it right now. Congratulations. So we we want to slurp this into jar eight. Uh, it's the last open jar. Probably wow. need uh, what? What do you need? Seven. Uh, uh, or seven? Yeah. Just like a few centimeters. Any branches? If we could get that, that might be too big. Yeah, branches are hard in the slurp. You never know, That's it might wedge in. Uh, well, we can, th uh, no, there's a. Well, this is only a black coral. Yeah, we can put it in the forward box, actually. Can you cut uh, just below the branch there? Yep. And we're gonna go in the forward bio box, starboard side. Okay. Uh, this would be a good one to get uh, 4K, Tammy. You get some nip out there. Okay, Roger. Is this just for ROV, or you want them to record just, that we're recording? Just for ROV. It's okay. A, it's a real good uh, demonstration of the two cameras, 90 out. So I'm trying to count. Do you want both? I can hit the wall and the 4K. Um, no, sorry, just the wall. Okay. Got a little bit. Uh, do another one when she opens the claw. You see what I'm Go after, right? But yep. Is that good there? Looks good. Yes. Good job. Right. Nice. Awesome. And this is going in the bio box, right? Yep. Yeah. Start or forward B. Okay. Make sure I can stick it out there without bumping the camera. Okay, I'm halted if you want to. Yeah. Looking at the wrong camera. Why is that other one camera not moving? <laughs> hmm. 
Very late. Sorry, no warning. It's, it's, uh... I got DSC framed up perfectly. Extend to get it closer. Oops, I should have spun this guy. Is this going to float? Sink. Hope not. <laughs> it's a sinker. Okay. Okay, close the box. Beautifully done. Good Great, job. Thank you. All right. Hey, science, is that 105? Yes. Do you want the ship to finish backing up or you want to hold while you situate? Craft to secure. You can uh, hold position now. Bridge nav, hold position. Thanks. Oh. Really close on the upslope of you. It's 10 meters. 10 and 10. <laughs> Not with those heaves we're taking. Well, we're now in our last uh, 15 minutes or so. So we're just going to try and scoot up as comfortably as possible. I think we pretty much just about crested here. So check that box. We can move a lot faster if you, or we're not stopping to uh, do more. I, yeah, I don't think we're going to be doing any more sampling um, unless there's a spectacular angular rock that is just <laughs> screaming to be brought to the surface. We have one more box that can go in. Is yeah, there? There is on, one rock. more rock, yeah. There, we have to get one more. Come rock. on, Steve. But of course, you're not allowed to find it until about uh, 5.35. <laughs> you ready for a move? Sure. Okay. We're going to keep going 068. I think so, yeah. Bridge now. Can we get another two zero meters bearing zero six eight? Sand waves rail. Uh can you switch the drug to the rail oh, cap? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah? What do you what do you feel like? Okay. It's your call. Yeah, and they're, they're also in a crevice. <laughs> Just <That's pen> <laughs> potentially perilous. It's actually getting bigger. <laughs> that 24-hour that, that dive is going to turn into much more than that if we try and sample in there. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice whip. Well, someone's wondering too, how attached are these rocks to the ground? You know, is it a gentle, just kind of push and they come off the ground or are they mostly pretty stuck? <laughs> <laughs> there, it's, it's pretty solid stuff. Um, you know, the crust is less strong than the underlying rock, but still uh, it's not gonna move without a fight yep. or a punch. Too strong for the arm. Potential rocks in there. I don't know, we have a pretty good rock puncher on our watch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. A couple of those. You're gonna wedge yourself in there. Sure. I don't know what. Do you think there's any value with these? Uh, I think those are all pretty stuck on. Let's not so. go for those. We, ha well, we have we have quite the eye on this watch. <laughs> You're on the four to eight now. <laughs> only for a few minutes. I'm only the dinner relief. Smack <laughs> Okay. You know, Every time I come up here, it doesn't mean you're any less valuable. You can sample all the rocks you want. I feel like a dinner relief is also when I get samples. Um, uh -huh. oh, do you guys okay. want to hold or are you just going to No, we're good. We're just gonna he's just going for it. Hey right now, I said you didn't need to poke the rocks. No, he's going. We're poking. I have an order from my... We're poking. <laughs> my pilot. <laughs> uh, one up we're poking. 
Uh, I had such such oh. optimism for that one too. No, absolutely not. I'm sorry, <laughs> Barry. Your okay. bubble and your dreams, but no. no. This geologist says no. It's okay. I got what I wanted anyway. You still got so to punch a rock. To answer, <laughs> to answer oh, the viewer question. Oh, this texture is so amazing. We got a card carrying rock puncher here. Hmm. <laughs> Definitely firmly attached to that. Oh, so you did get a sparse brancher. Yeah. Nice. So pillowy up here. For Let's see. Are any of these over to the right, the right size? What's that? To the, oh, the ones on the right. She's wondering if they're small yeah. enough and I just want to get the lasers a little bit closer to ones on the right, kind of like this one. Just to see. My eyes do not uh, judge the size very well. But the texture is good? You like the way everything looks? Oh, these are super covered, but sometimes they're all right. Okay, that guy's probably too big. Okay. You want to try I to have seen what I up? needed. Right. No. Okay. Uh, I think we're okay. Let's move on. It's starting to level off a little bit. You never know what you'll find up on top. Maybe, maybe. Even if we don't find one, just me seeing this texture is something that That's I'll get call. to put into a report for this. Mm -hmm. Oh, Tronicops. Oh, yay! These look uh, columnar, actually. Some of those. Mm, Crust crusted, but maybe no, columnar. No, I'd say we're well, still more know. in the pillowy range. Hello, fish. Like, these are little lobate edges. Zoom on All right, I've been oh, over. Oh, is that another dandelion? Yep. Let's go to the fish. All right, this one's for the internet here, this yeah. Tronicops. <laughs> All right, is, uh, I do not know how to do zoom this in, still right? camera. Steve, do you know how yeah, to you press, make this um, focus? AF for focus, and then you hit the camera button, take an image. Oh, oh yeah. There's your oh, Tronic Ops. Guy is so cute, cute little guy. I finally saw one. See, this is what happens when you finish a dive in the proper place. You see Tronic Ops. They're the right so time. cute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Can Angular we also fish. zoom to the left at the dandelion? We could. Okay, you guys got your cuteness factor there? Yep. yep. All right, ready to go. <laughs> we we had some pretty good imagery of the dandelion a little bit oh, earlier. Okay. Did you see the dandelion earlier? Uh, we had a dandelion. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. it's going away. So I don't know about your dandelion, but I know nope. we saw oh, one. No, no, I was, I was referring <laughs> to the one on your watch. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I think Dijana was in here for it. Oh, I no, think she was, yeah. Oh, these are the so forehead. encrusted, but so nice looking. <laughs> oh, of course. Oh, but they're so pretty. Some, I love some more uh, nice stuff coming up, too. Zoom out a bit, right? So, what are these, Steve? We didn't have these, I don't think, on my watch at the, all. The corals here? Yeah. Yeah, we've got... Um, We've got a couple of bamboo corals here. Some very, very highly branching ones. Bridge nine. Ours, yeah. I think, two as big as we zero got zero was six six maybe eight. three branches. And yeah, that was only no, one. I mean, we, we, we saw these a, a few times. Um, I think they were, zoom in there if you want, right? I think they were nodal branchers, which seems to be the case here. Are these little yeah, tiny anemones. Fly trap anemones or a different uh, type? They might be a different type, yeah. Um, colloquially, we call them ring anemones, but uh, it's Ooh. not necessarily true sometimes. All right. Nodal branching bamboo coral. Happy? Happy. Moving on. Yeah, we gotta we gotta have one more chunk of cups for the end. How much longer do we have? Another 
hour or two? About <laughs> seven, oh, eight minutes. Look at this. This is beautiful eight. texture eight. here of yeah. these lava rocks. Why do you say that? Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> so pretty. Uh, <laughs> and some sponges. Yep. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Oh, she's back. Swapping out. All the, all the fun stuff happens when you leave the seat. It's because I'm here, Dijana. Yeah. So do the rocks, all the lovely rocks when I come for dinner relief. Mm-hmm. I'm really impressed that this is still as sloped as it is. It's uh, yeah. The bathy's a little bit off, I know, but I thought it would uh, even out a bit faster than this. But this seems to be the zone. Um, right on the edge of a lot of these seamounts, you do get higher density communities, and we saw some larger fans. Yes, we did. That makes sense. It's more stable here. Currents are still pretty reasonable. But uh, definitely not what I would call a high density community really anywhere on this dive, except in those cracks and crevices where you had really yes, high density. Yes, those were nice. That was really nice, yeah. We collected a Niskin at one of those. I know, yeah. Looking forward to checking that one out, seeing who's represented in that sample. I don't know how many corals were living in there. Couldn't even see all the way through. Yeah, that was wild. Mm -hmm. I saw that. That's unusual, is it? Yeah, it, it, it's not extremely unusual. I mean, even like precious corals like Hemicorellium, for some reason, likes to, you know, th it'll settle in a hole uh, if the float conditions are right. I don't know, just they do weird things. That would be an overhang. Yeah. Hey, um, just trying to work out the shadow. can you pan right mm -hmm. for a second? Uh, sure. I have an overhanging cliff above us. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So this is this is all sheet flow. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't nodules or something. So this is our wall here, Steve. Yeah, that'll do it. Micro yeah. So a lot of these species are similar to ones we saw actually a bit deeper. I don't think we've really transitioned past the that 1,900 meters depth. Um, oh, there you go, Ritigorgia. Not well represented Ooh. on this dive so far, but typical of this kind of assemblage. Uh, Calyptrophora and Norella species. Um, Norella macrocalyx is in here as well as uh, Calyptrophora, maybe Clarki, and others. Mm. A diverse patch right here, huh? Yep, polyopagon yeah. oh. sponges. Oh, what's that? Is that one of the weird sponges at the top again? Yeah, that, yeah. that's one called polyopagon. It's okay. a glass sponge, but it's um, we've collected it in this area in the past uh, past cruises. representative of this depth range. I think we've seen a number of smaller ones uh, at this site, which suggests that maybe there's some recruitment going on still. But this definitely looks like it found a spot. It's definitely one of the larger individuals we've seen on the whole dive. Let's have a peek around the corner here. in the background, DSC. Yeah. Those little brittle stars.
push in a little more if you want. The sponges come in so many forms and shapes. I wonder what influences their morphology. Because we've seen a couple of them and they all look very different. Right, like this one just looks like it got unrolled, right. you know? Oh, this is a question I can't answer. <clears throat> how far are we from the surface? Well, if I know how deep we are, I don't have that on one of my screens, but 1, if you go to Nautilus Live, we're about 1,972 meters deep. There you go. Okay, you can zoom out, thanks. And also, if you follow along on our website, there is a panel on the far right of our main page on Nautilus Live that says live data, which updates with our depth and current temperature. Hey everyone, this is Megan stepping in for Steve. Hi Megan, <coughs> stepping in for Steve. Hi Megan. Hello. Uh, are we good for another step, Dan? Yep. Great. Bridge, Nav. Two zero meters, zero six eight. Thanks. <laughs> That's a cool view in Argus. Nice mound there. Whoa, what's happening over Whoa. here? <laughs> we have a new scientist joining us. <laughs> so Megan, I think uh, Steve mentioned, but we have a off bottom time of a few more minutes. Yes, we do. A minute and 40 seconds. Well, I did recalculate based <laughs> on our current depth and uh, we do have a slightly revised time. Cool. Uh, let me revise based on our current depth. So 131 minutes to the surface, so we've gained uh, two minutes. Okay. So we can add two minutes to All our right. We got to be on time. Oh, you're muted. Thanks. Thanks for that update. On time, right? On time, on yeah. Time. We're going to be, it's not going to be our fault that we're late. Any last minute samples that we're looking for, or are we just? We're just gonna look around and yeah. do some zooms. We could zoom on this, one more rock. this coral, one this more rock. zoanthids. <laughs> um, and then we're gonna do a niskin when we're up in the water column, about 20 meters off bottom. I like the colors on this guy. Yeah. Wow. Can we get any closer? Can you zoom any more? Nice. Sweet. Oh, that's great. Nice. We're getting some great still cam shots. Thank you. That's good. Move it on. So Megan, you also said you wanted to get one, one more rock. What's that? You also said you wanted to get one more rock. Did I say that? Did you just Maybe. put that in my mouth? <laughs> <laughs> We've become the uh, the rock poking watch. Yeah. <laughs> we can always investigate. These look very stuck to the bottom. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Good. This we would be taking the whole seam out. We do have room. That'd be cool. That would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Just like drag it to the top. <laughs> That's something that we've discussed on our watch a few times with Amber. Just gonna Are we at the top? I think so. Not. We didn't quite make it. Quite the top top. It is being the top on the dive plan. It's kind of flat. Yeah, our map for this dive is a bit screwy. We don't. There's been some features on the map that don't fully align with what we're seeing on okay. the seafloor. Uh, yeah. We do look like we've leveled out here a little bit. Not a lot. Yeah. Over in Argus. Yeah, the Argus view is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not a lot of returns. In is Argus, that an anemone we see there? Where do you see it? Right Sorry, there. I wasn't. Video looking. doing a swap. Oh, I think that was a holothurian. Sarah Bryan's. 
ครับ
Uh, we're starting our ascent with a uh, approximate on deck time of 2000. So now, which one is it? This one. And we need to update. Lift up a little. Oh. Half wrap and then lift up a little. And we are. Right. We are um, leaving uh, altitude at 21 meters for the, the what is it called? We have completed our dive. Last two uh, falling to green. Coming to go for Niskin. Um, five Wait. and six are still open. Five is orange? No, five is green. Yeah. Yeah, five is green. Sorry. I think six four is, is orange. orange. Six is impossible. Or you can just say vehicles ascending. Oops. So close. Nice. And then the other one. Boom. Boom. Yep. Got it. Pop. Nice. Sweet. Excellent. One zero five. Central right, Rebecca? Pacific. And then we've completed. That is 106. Um, so oh, they collected some samples the, while we were at dinner. Uh, our things. transect and our ascending. Yeah. The dive's not complete until we're at top. So we've completed our underwater transect. Okay, Herc, what can you do? What can you do? Pull vertical up. We have left the seafloor. Energize. Ooh. Energize. <laughs> Finally got thread. Transformers? Here we go. 13 meters a minute. It's a ground groundfall. We're going to see a lot of nice marine uh, snow. It's on the edge there. Mm -hmm. Maybe some sharks. That'd be sweet. There's been some shark sightings. There has. Very so they exciting. finally put the highlight of the five foot up no. on a I've been using the them for our interactions. because. Very nice. Love Elementary them. students love sharks. Yeah. Me too. Same, yeah. <laughs> so adults love sharks. I yeah. love sharks. People love sharks. People love sharks. Uh, At some point we might see some siphonophores. Yeah, maybe siphonophores. Yeah. Maybe jellies. Maybe squid. Maybe maybe some marine snow. Come up a little faster. Maybe some tiny oh, fish. always some marine <laughs> snow. <laughs> All right, Steve is back. I'm out. Have a nice Bye, water. Megan. Thanks, Megan. Bye. Are we gonna <laughs> pause to sort out the tether wrap? Uh, no, I'll just. Do you want to take? Yeah. Oh. Largus up above her. Come on, pick it up. Oh, okay. You're uh, zooming pretty fast there. An hour and a half of Blue Sea TV. Blue Sea TV, um, my uh, favorite programming. Lift an Argus up above her because I can <laughs> take a turn out of my tether. Roger, okay. This will not be our maintain <laughs> speed. They're ready for the next dive. Like, all right, great. So where, where are we going next? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Her vert vertical velocity. I see, got it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, yes, 15 is. Right on. Good. Can you, uh, yeah. Hold 30 there for a minute until we get the uh, 20 inch delta. Mm -hmm. All right, hit us with some uh, questions yep. for this blue water. All right, come what's ahead. coming in? Argus, uh, let's see. Well, we first thing yeah. is maybe we can touch on, we can learn from some of the water samples that we have taken on this dive or what we're hoping to learn. All right. So we took uh, five water samples at various depths along this transect. Uh, typically, they were associated with high-density um, biological communities. The last one was kind of a, a control sample okay, um, that was you know, in the absence of uh, you know, high-density or 
really any biology as a background sample okay. for environmental DNA. <clears throat> environmental DNA is a, a way that we can extract genetic material out of the water column um, that is representative of a, an area. Usually um, these animals that are in the area could be things like yeah. corals and sponges and fish, basically anything that sloughs off tissue or um, you know, perhaps mucus into the water column. We can sequence that material after filtering or filtering it, and then uh, hopefully determine who's in the area based on their genetic genetic uh, markers. Is this something that you do in, like in your lab back in Boston? Are there companies that do this? I'm just curious about the pipeline. It's yep. really cool technology. Yeah, so I am uh, collaborating with a uh, researcher at. Um, the Northwest, Fish Northwest Fisheries Science Center uh, in Seattle, Meredith Everett, has been uh, helping us develop their eDNA sampling program on the Nautilus for a number of years. And uh, her lab is going to be doing much of the uh, DNA sampling uh, for the, the eDNA sampling. Um, but my work is complementar complementary to that in that uh, I'm interested in trying to barcode very specific corals, uh, looking at their DNA very specifically from one sample and trying to um, sequence each of those samples you know, that we collected today uh, to better understand and maybe match those known sequences to a species to one of the unknown sequences in our eDNA sample. And of course I have like a hundred questions, but that's just, <laughs> that's just me. We'll take the, keep your questions coming into the chat. But I'm curious, is there any work done on the expression level? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think we had, uh, we had this question that got interrupted by something. We didn't get to finish it um, a few days ago, but the expression, so gene expression has been studied in corals in some parts um, <coughs> of the deep sea, usually related to response uh, to stressors. Um, in particular, uh, it's been used um, to in, in experimental conditions to identify uh, corals response, genetic level response to uh, temperature change, uh, pH change, um, you know, the acidity of the water, um, which is a, kind of trying to simulate what end century uh, seas might be like for these corals in the wild. Uh, and also uh, temperature, pH, what was the other variable? Oxygen, changes okay. in oxygen, yeah. <clears throat> That's cur Do you know where that work's coming out of? I just... Yep, that, uh, some of it is, uh, was done under a researcher named Alexis, Alexis Weinegg's uh, dissertation research at the Cordes Lab at Temple, Uni Temple University. Um, but uh, there's also been some other work that's been done that I'm familiar with on uh, octocorals uh, and their response um, to uh, stressors like uh, environmental contaminants like oil and um, you know, dispersant chemicals uh, that uh, happened off after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010. And that research also came out of the Cordes lab by a um, researcher named uh, Dr. Danielle DeLeo, uh, who I believe is at Haverford College right now. Cool. So it's just really interesting. Steve's going to be working at looking at diversity on the DNA level. But also another interesting question, so DNA is like, who are you? <laughs> and an interesting question is like, what's actually being turned on, or what what proteins are being made under different types of conditions? And that's another really interesting thing to look at, especially with my background as a marine animal physiologist, looking at molecular physiology. Yep. Uh, that excites me. Yeah, it, it, it's very interesting. It, it's also very hard. Uh, you know, we're, we're not really working with full genomes of a lot of these animals, so we, um, you know, only know what certain, uh, you know, genes turning on or off 
or certain proteins being created might do because they've been observed in other animal systems. Um, but we don't have any what are, what are called like model animal systems to really say, you know, okay, this is exactly what this does in this coral in this coral colony when it's uh, uh, subject to these conditions. So um, it's uh, if if anyone out there has been doing science and not worked with a uh, a model system like fruit flies or something like that, uh, I'm sure you can commiserate. <laughs> Additional. Fruit flies, nematodes, yeah. uh, these are models. Of, uh, Even sea urchins mice. now. Yeah, sea yeah. urchins, where you have the whole genome is, you know, basically mapped. You know exactly what each gene does, uh, you know, in a certain time of its life. Um, these non-model systems, like deep water corals, you have to just draw some, some similarities, some connections to whatever the closest animal um, that's been studied is. So there's interesting work in that realm happening right now and a bright future for that stuff too because there's, there's yeah. some challenges associated with doing work on non-model organisms. One of the projects that um, we've been trying to understand uh, in the lab I'm currently in is what is the response of uh, a coral in the deep sea to predation? You know, if it's actively being consumed or eaten, um, you know, does it have certain genes uh, that it'll turn on to compensate for, you know, say tissue loss um, or, you know, something like that. Uh, that work is ongoing. We're still trying to get samples for that kind of work. Um, but I think we've made a little bit of progress on some of the samples we've collected so far for that. But the, for a lot for a lot of those very specific questions. We need to have very specific methods uh, and preservations of the animal in a certain state and with a certain chemical. So it basically freezes it in time. Um, otherwise, if it undergoes stress due to changes in yeah, mm -hmm. the environment, um, it could confound our results. That's an, that's an interesting uh, technology development is can, can we freeze things? at depth <laughs> for collection yeah well so we we've i've used certain uh collection techniques before um we we most commonly use a chemical called rna later um usually kind of freezes um these processes uh, of these animals but we've actually been able to immerse them at depth so basically take them from the environment put them in the preservative at depth and effectively freeze them at a, at a molecular level um, only because RNA later is an extremely saline uh, solution. So when you take, say, a quiver off of a bottle of RNA later in the deep sea, it will stay. It doesn't go anywhere. In seawater, so it will stay uh, in the cup. And then you just put the sample in, put the quiver back on. They were just starting to talk about doing things like that um, 15 years ago. Yep. Now that's a thing. That's awesome. That's a thing. <laughs> Used it last year. That's awesome. Yeah. You can also homebrew RNA later now. What? Yeah, you didn't know that? No. Yeah, you, they, they, there's a recipe, cracked recipe out there. Nice. Some, uh, you can brew so it up like yourself. It's like open source now. Mm -hmm. Have you done that? Uh, I have not personally <laughs> made it, but I know that we have a, we had a team of undergraduates who are very um, beaker has to do that kind of work. It's very tedious because you have to RNA later is a very specific pH and it needs a very specific amount of salt um, And you have to titrate it to get it to the right pH so it preserves. Oh, I'm just gonna buy mine <laughs> It's extremely expensive. Like $500 a bottle So not as easy as homebrewing beers what you're saying. Yeah, no, not quite <laughs> Definitely not as fun either words uh, afterwards either um, yeah, but freezing something at depth usually is the, that would be the gold standard, I suppose. Um, but it, it's strange, you know, even though we preserve something like that, it's very good at preserving, you know, RNA and, you know, molecular products in the animal. Um, RNA is awful if you're trying to do any morphological work, um, because corals are, uh, 
uh, calcium carbonate, and RNA later is acidic. So it just... Yeah. So if you ever put chalk, uh, acid on chalk, you know, you just, just... That's just a, that's just a fun experiment it. right yeah. there. So you need to collect animals uh, like we collect them also, so we can study their morphology. So this one I have to ask, because I'm a little curious too. <clears throat> in The Little Mermaid, the poor unfortunate souls that Ursula turns the people to, the mer people to, are those tunicates? I, d I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit something I'm super embarrassing. Go for um, it. I have not seen The Little Mermaid until last year, and even then I don't really have any recollection of what it was, the specifics about parts of the story. It was not one of the movies that I grew up with. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. So don't listen to music. Yeah. You just saw a little more. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's uh, a little weird in my house. I mean, okay, so Little Mermaid came out in '89, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. I, my 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 Disney uh, frame of reference is you know mid to late '90s. Uh, which is, you know, I, I suppose it was, uh, you know, that movie was still around, but definitely was dominated by things like Lion King and Toy Story. That was my... Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so Little Mermaid would be my generation then. And Aladdin. Oh, I remember that one, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was probably the earliest movie I remember. So I guess this question would be for our um, ROV pilots. What, how many hours of uh, time do you need behind the stick in order to qualify, in order to, you know, pilot the subs, and what kind of training uh, is required in order to do it? Sorry, we weren't. <laughs> ROV there? Yeah, we're here now. <laughs> uh, the question is. Uh, how many hours or what kind of training do you have to do in order to pilot the ROVs? And Ooh, uh, flight yeah. hours. I'm curious about yeah. that, too. How many flight hours do you have, Dan and Antonella? So you don't need any flight hours or training to operate this ROV. We just need a respiration and a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> I've said many times that operating this ROV is the easy, easy part. It's uh, maintaining it and repairing it. That's the difficult part, at least for me. You can't really get training on this vehicle unless you sit up here and operate it. Would you say playing asteroids has helped you, though? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, it did teach me how to. Is he on, is he on SPL? I didn't hear his response. Yeah, I'm on a field. No video games. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, video games that didn't help me in the least in this career. It's um, I have a technical background and also a practical background. I grew up turning my 
matches, fixing cars, taking things apart. I started, uh, as soon as I could reach the doorknobs in the house, I took them all apart, figured out how they worked. I was putting them back together when my mom caught me. And stuff like that. So I still like to take things apart, figure out how they work. The, um, the operational experiences for piloting the ROV didn't come easy for me. It took many hours of uh, getting kicked out of the pilot's chair. A lot of um, watching other more experienced pilots, watching how they operate, and um, trying to emulate their their uh, operational techniques. Same with the uh, operating the manipulator. And uh, repairing it, there's some techniques there, but we are uh, PDF manual junkies in the old days, uh, paper manual junkies. So my very first job offshore, I made the mistake of telling my supervisor I was bored. And <laughs> he said, you're bored, really? And in the control van back then, we had uh, paper manuals, so there was a shelf probably two or three meters long, just stuffed full of paper manuals. So he said, uh, pick one of those books and look for all the greasy pages with uh, holes torn out of the three-ring binder. And he also handed me a box of uh, those little things you stick on when you have a torn out uh, sheet out of a three-ring binder. <laughs> My job was to fix all the torn out ones. <laughs> and uh, then he would quiz me every day when I came back on shift. And I basically had read all the manuals in the van on the system and was not bored for weeks. <laughs> and a lot of it I didn't understand at the time. And it was kind of, it's hard to read technical stuff when you, you don't get your hands on it, and get greasy or oily or shock yourself. Uh, but when it did come time to work on that kind of stuff, I had, at the very least, I knew where to look in those manuals to find it to get more information. But I had some clue of what things look like, so I would know like what tools they're going to need or what maybe test equipment. I certainly knew what manual to go get them. So a lot of it was, uh, for me anyways, was on, on the job training. But most of the uh, kids we have out here, like Antonella, has an engineering background. Jake has an engineering background. Mm -hmm. uh, both the other uh, Herc pilots, Robert and Trevor, one's an electrical engineer, one's a mechanical engineer. So they didn't go to school or play video games to learn how to, to operate the vehicle. They learned sitting right here. These kids now. Yeah. What's your take on it? Yeah, I agree. I mean, even though we're called pilots and that's sort of the thing that people, you know, see us do, I'd say 95% of the job is actually doing work on the vehicles. And that's, you know, involves whatever systems the vehicles need repairs on. So hydraulics, electronics, camera systems, um, AC and DC electrical systems, like it's kind of learning on the job for operations and for maintenance, but having a technical background really helps having some foundational knowledge of the physics, the engineering, um, everything that goes into it. And like Dan said, like reading the manuals and figuring out how to how to do it. So yeah, I definitely agree with agree with that. For example. We have a long list of uh, punch list items from this uh, from this cruise. Uh, as soon as this thing hits the deck, we'll be you know, we have to change the uh, hydraulic power unit pump, which is uh, that's a hydraulic background. We have to get into uh, two of the one atmosphere bottles. Uh, want to repair Argus's electrical thrusters, so that involves high voltage and control electronics and uh, and we have a issue with the craft arm where we hot wired it so i have to get into another one atmosphere bottle to rectify that probably do some software modifications 
mm -hmm. to uh, change the way it turns itself on. Possibly some electronics to uh, build some new hardware. And then we have to seal those bottles back up in a fashion where they don't flood. So we have to be uh, make sure the O-rings are all clean. Then we have to pull a vacuum test on them and then backfill them with nitrogen, which involves uh, yeah, pressure, vacuum. And kind of we actually have the same um, vacuum pressure pump that science has in the lab that we use for that. Those are three of the probably the top of the <laughs> top of the punch list items. So we'll be busy from the time this thing hits the deck till the next batch of scientists is here and we're on location again. So yep. dive. We have more more stuff to do than we can possibly get done. Yep. <laughs> so while you're all partying we'll be <laughs> we won't be <laughs> <laughs> No. Not nope. joining the science party. It's good to know for anyone who wants to be an RV pilot, look to being an electrical engineer. Systems engineer. Yeah. Mechanical engineer. <laughs> Software engineer. <laughs> I mean, that being said, not everyone on the team has an engineering degree or engineering background. It's more willingness to get your hands dirty and take stuff apart. Like, our boss is a biologist by training. Um, so, but he, you know, has his hands on the vehicles. He's, you know, learned for however long he's been doing this. So it's not strictly necessary to go and get an engineering degree, but, you know, willingness to take stuff apart, working on cars like Dan did, or, you know, poking at computers or electronics, it's all really helpful. And it's all very practical. Um, theoretical foundations help, but you need to actually have the practical skills to go along with that. So for you out there listening that are maybe, you know, middle school, high school realm, engaging in robotics, Lego robotics, building things, taking things apart, those are all really good skills to continue to practice and build upon, just in general. So I have a funny story, blue water story. <laughs> so if you get a rocket scientist and a physicist to organize your hydraulic <laughs> fitting drawer and you leave them unsupervised for hours at a time. <laughs> how, how, what do you think they would do? I know what they did, so <laughs> I can't say. I'll ruin the story. <laughs> so they're two super smart, intelligent individuals and uh, they spent hours. It's beautifully organized. But uh, do you think they like looked up any of the specs on the fittings to see what kind they were? <laughs> I'm gonna say no. No. So we have this hydraulic. There's a lot. There's like you know probably fifty thousand dollars worth of hydraulic fittings in this drawer, and they're organized by. Uh, spinning things, <laughs> elbow things. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have spinning females and uh, O-ring fittings. And it's quite, um, you know, it makes it really easy for us because there's like a whole bunch of different kinds of the same elbow fitting, for example. Or, oh yeah, we have adapters. Adapters. Uh, we have dissimilar yeah, ends. Oh yeah, dissimilar <laughs> ends. <laughs> Who are, uh, <laughs> who are these <laughs> I smile every time I uh, open the drawer up. <laughs> Sometimes I'm frustrated. I'm looking for like a FTX 90 to, you know, dashboard JIC or something like that. Which most of us wouldn't call that. But if I ask them to get me a dashboard JIC to dashboard SAE, they would go, huh? Is that <laughs> in the spinning things? <laughs> 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 Those ends are dissimilar. They are dissimilar. <laughs> That's where you will find that. A dissimilar <laughs> ends compartment. <laughs> Who is this? Who's responsible for this delay? Oh, this was a couple of the kids we had out here. A couple of the interns. So <laughs> very well-educated interns. Recently? Uh, that's been a couple mm. of years I'm ago. I'm trying now. to guess. Okay. This way, wow. <laughs> they've both been back since. Uh, ah. They've both come uh, just light years from, you know, 
simple things like how to put a grease gun in a cartridge and you know <laughs> replace the cartridge in a grease gun so we can grease the winch or um, you know, uh, fill up the uh, compensation Hi highly technical bug sprayer we have mm -hmm. uh, with the right kind of oil without introducing a bunch of contaminants so uh, to operate in the vehicles both of them have, uh, so they've learned how to do all the maintenance and the turnarounds and uh, operations as well. That's kind of cool. Everybody starts somewhere. But they'll have one thing that I will never have, uh, no matter how much experience I have out here. They have that education that they started with, right? So anybody can get the on-the-job experience, but the, the education is that's a tool they have that I'll, that I won't I won't ever possess. I think it's pretty cool that, you know, different paths kind of lead to sort of the same careers in, in a sense. Looks like we're coming up uh, averaging 17 to 20 meters a minute. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. We need to revise our uh, surface time. Can we, go, can we go back down and reclaim that time a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> Are you planning on slowing down? We'll probably have we'll to slow rock. down as we um, come up. We've, okay. had some, we've had some issues with yep. our uh, motor getting hot and uh, the risk for getting too full. We have a wounded um, shaft seal and a hydraulic pump, and there's a compensated volume in between the motor and the pump. Some mysterious reason it's going from a lower pressure volume to a higher pressure area. Can't figure out why, except the seal must be compromised somehow, or there's a micro scratch in the shaft, and as it's spinning, it's acting as a micro pump. But the result is um, the two liter bladder that contains our hydraulic working fluid gets too full, like a balloon. If it also gets hot, it will uh, start venting, which is typically bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised where I didn't expect that. I should have gotten another rock. That big Too one, light. the boulder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Might want to call down and let folks know that we might be doing a earlier recovery. Six thirty, six forty. Unless yeah. you want to slow down in the water column more. Six thirty. Seven thirty. Sorry, seven thirty. I was like, that's really soon. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. really are traveling at warp <laughs> speed here, people. Seven thirty or seven forty. We'll slow down. When I get Shower. Okay. But even then, we'll have a revised time, unless you're planning on really slowing down. Well, no, that's about right, Sam. So if we're on the surface, then... That's true. 7.30, 7.40, then we're on deck by 8. That's a good point. Especially since we've been streaming ahead. It's taking a little more time. Yeah. Yeah, it takes, what, 10 minutes to get the time perk comes around. It doesn't take a half hour, though, you're right. Yeah. they got to be plus or minus 15 minutes. Those are the terms? <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, those are the acceptable terms. If then you're on the surface at quarter to tell, you can be on deck at 8. So we're we're gonna be a little early. It's also important that the samples don't sit around on the surface or 50 meters. So yeah. if they can, if we can do anything to either slow it down or we're uh, yeah we can certainly slow it down. We're less than half an hour early at the moment. Anyway. So let's see. Front row. I don't know if you introduced yourself and shared your musical genre. 
I'm pretty far ahead of you. Yes, we all did. We did? Yep. Oh. Uh, I don't think we did. Maybe the, you two didn't. I think we stopped at you, Tammy. I don't think Dan Antonella or Samantha did. Maybe. I, I can't remember. It was just four, just four hours ago. Four. It was probably Eight. like an hour and a half ago. Really? <laughs> That's it? <laughs> my God. Oh, it was this watch? How long have we been watch? in blue water? It, it wasn't last night. No. This morning? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> uh, what kind of music do you like, Samantha? Uh, I, I like a lot of music. Um, I have a record player at home, which I don't get to use very much because I'm never there. Um, Uh, big fan of Motown and Soul. Um, on this cruise, I've been listening to a lot of Nathaniel Rateliff, which is more on the folk Americana side. Very nice. Um, also really like La Dame Blanche, who's a Cuban hip hop artist who I saw live once and she wore a cape on stage and it was fantastic. <laughs> um, was I supposed to introduce myself? Yeah. yeah Samantha yeah. Wishnack, Navigator. <laughs> the four days. <laughs> I like music. Dan. So my favorite band changes every at least five years. So lately, um, yeah, but one that doesn't change that uh, Tammy's husband is into, I listen. I like Tool a lot. I feel like that's like a prerequisite of a lot of the ROV pilots. I've heard that from numerous. It's definitely <laughs> a lot of math and engineering that goes into their stuff. Hmm. Or tool. I've never heard of Tool before in my life. Uh, the Just first throwing that out there. I'm first Googling concert it. I took my kid to was a Tool concert. Wow. And yeah, the only problem is you have to like wait 10 years for the next album. They're very technical. Yeah. yeah, they actually write the music first and then the words. Jelly. What kind of jelly is that? A distant one. It's a down jelly. A or down jelly? It's a down <laughs> jelly and we're an up <laughs> ROV. So, have you ever, have, I don't know, have we ever done midwater transects with uh, Herc? Uh, vertical ones. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. You mean right now? Horizontal transects yeah. through the midwater. <laughs> yeah, like we've never put plankton nets on the top. And yeah. on or Okeanos does these midwater transects where they pick a depth, they hold there, and they just drive through the water. And uh, they do like fast, like high, you know, high, uh, you know, what is the word? Uh, like really detailed zooms on all the plankton they see over the course of uh, like a kilometer or something. Hmm. I don't know. It done them a few times, but it's, uh, it's challenging. Challenging definitely requires a lot of skilled, like small movements to be able to zoom in on some of the plankton. to do uh, plankton toes for a scientist called Anna Metaxas. She's uh, East Coast, uh, Canada somewhere, Canada University. Put these big giant nets on top of the ROV. They're like, uh, they look like a windsock. And then they terminate in it into a, like a peanut butter size jar, what you're typically buy your peanut butter in. Run around for a couple hours mowing the lawn, collecting LinkedIn, something, and, and video, of course. You don't get tangled with those? What's that? You don't get tangled up? Still didn't hear you, sorry. Tangled you get, how long are they? Oh, no, they're, they're probably two meters long. The front's probably, uh, I don't know, three, four hundred in the diameter bigger than a five gallon bucket size. But no, we, we attach them and they have this frame so they're stretched out, so the back's attached. So they're like a like a rigid windsock, but they, you know, they all, they're not on the vehicle, they roll up. I think they're made 
out of some kind of nylon, pine nylon or something. Water flows through, but the plankton doesn't. And she spends hours under looking at stuff on it with a microscope. It looks to me like a jar full of goo <laughs> it comes up. <laughs> Ninety minutes, is that better? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Hey Tammy, would you put the winch um I forget which one. You can. I can't put it on that one. I thought you had monitor one there. Uh nope. Nope. Just I just have three there. and four. You can put it here in front of me if you want. Can I put winch yeah. store? Put it right. Uh, hmm? yeah, you can put it on there if you want, but I got it right here. Oh, I just wanted the big one. I was going to put future winch on my... Use winch hold. <laughs> winch hold? Okay. That's the one I usually do. Yeah, because the winch alt is out of focus still because I keep oh, forgetting. Okay. <laughs> Which one is future winch? Winch alt. Winch alt, okay. I just call them both future winch, but I always put winch yeah. hold on there. No, so you can see up there the camera yep. you're looking at is the bigger round one, and then the little black square next to it is the winch alt that's, they really are pretty much the same. Gotcha, yeah. You know. Thank you. Axis, ca <coughs> Axis cameras in a really nice housing. <laughs> all those access housings and put them in a environmentally IP67 housing. Oh yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I have all the old housings. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. Mm. Slowly populating oh. them with raspberry pies. Hmm. <laughs> 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 Could do something with that. Yeah, they're meant to be able to go out outdoors. Hmm. So you're tracking your cows with them? Uh, no, the ones that Ed has in there. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have them all. The oh, here. The oh, no, you're, yeah. So you can do cow behavior analysis. Uh, no, just see if they're there. <laughs> uh, watch them on their cabin. Uh, see if they come up every day to water. A bit. Deanna goes you out. could ride a cow to What's that? You could ride a cow detector. Yeah. The, the system could tell you what they're doing. You could get alerts sent to your watch. <laughs> so Steve and Rebecca, I'm curious. We've had dives both in the monument and outside of the monument. Coming up to uh, the, the end part of the expedition. What are some personal highlights that stand out? Uh, um, my expectation of the area has changed a little bit. Uh, you know, in 2019, we did three dives here that were um, really kind of uh, really exploratory. We didn't, didn't have any expectations of what we were going to find. I thought that densities were quite low. I think that remains the same at most of the sites we saw. You know, biodiversity was, you know, expected you know, or, you know, moderate to high, but density of animals was much lower than I expected. We didn't find a lot of large ridges where there was, you know, multiple colonies per square meter. Uh, there were few and far between. Um, so th that kind of, uh, you know, that that's one thing that was particularly striking for me, uh, just the consistency of low densities. Um, we'd made a few observations that were really important below 3,000 meters. Pretty much any coral collection below 3,000 meters is uh, probably either going to be a new species or a really significant range extension. And so I think that there's some really good uh, opportunities for uh, those kinds of findings uh, when we get samples back to shore. Um, what else? Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I would say two more things. The, the monument sites, I don't think really represented uh, all that much difference to the sites outside of the monument. So there's quite a bit of similarity in both the coral species we find and the densities, um, minus the fact that uh, Kingman, uh, Kingman Reef and Palmyra are much shallower, so you get different species within the monument uh, that you might get outside on the seamounts, which are typically a bit deeper, uh, the, the summits of them at least. Um, yeah, and then the last thing was how, how difficult it is to, <laughs> my appreciation for how difficult it is to dive around Kingman and Palmyra remains the same. Um, I had come down with the plan of doing some much, much, much shallower dives around Kingman and Palmyra on this expedition, but the weather and uh, other factors kind of fought against us. So I still have a lot of interest in doing shallower dives, um, you know, pending some better weather conditions in the future. I think for the most part, uh, the rocks kind of looked as expected. Um, I think it was really interesting to find some sedimentary features and layering and after pulling up some of the rocks, realizing how many of them actually were sedimentary as opposed to volcanic in nature. Um, but another highlight was definitely the sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Catching them on camera was pretty cool. Those oceanic white tips. We might see some more in an hour or so. <laughs> Stay tuned. Jordan, how about you? Highlights. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is my first trip out to the Central Pacific like this to do deep water, you know, these deep water expeditions. So I really didn't know what to expect. I feel like I've learned a lot about deep sea coral colonies, though, and crusty rocks. Um, so yeah, it's all been super educational for me. Um, and I think I've definitely walked away with a new favorite uh, deep sea animal, though. And it's definitely that crab that carries around, you know, other animals on its back. There's sometimes it's an anemone too. It's not always zoanthids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pretty species. crafty. So that, yeah, that was pretty impressive. I'm like, all right. It's <laughs> nice. Um, for me, I think uh, the highlight of my experience with this expedition is the power of telepresence. And although I'm surrounded by an amazing team of ocean explorers on board, the technological ability to bring everybody along with us so and ask the questions that come in my head the questions from the schools that we interact with and the questions from the audience it really felt like we were all exploring together and that was a quite powerful experience so far so I'm I'm leaving with a newfound respect for exploration that includes everyone. And I like the sharks. <laughs> and the brightly colored corals. Um, I had no idea about coral diversity, deep sea corals, and all of their various associates and how they, you know, they are habitat building organisms in the deep sea. And so that's been really eye-opening, and I want to continue to follow Steve's work, especially when it comes to, you know, mapping out who's out there. <laughs> yeah. How are they related? How are they connected? Who's new? Really Who belongs simple here? questions. Yeah, yeah, we still don't know. Yeah, Steve, we're going to be uh, pen pals after this. Absolutely. Yeah. That's one thing I can do for a while is chat about corals. We all have our talents. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the end of it for me. <laughs> no. Sometimes I can talk about sponges, but not well. Well, the sponges were really interesting, too, and the sea stars and the mm. sea urchins and the predatory tunicates and the bottom-dwelling siphonophores. I mean, it just goes on and on. I didn't mention a rock. The rocks were cool, too. 
<laughs> Thanks, Tajana. I understand <laughs> the difference between angular rock and non-angular rock. <laughs> Do you want this uh, this good rock, bad rock pamphlet to uh, take home? Is it <laughs> good rock, bad rock. Oh, good rock. So when you're out, next time you're out for a hike, I can I can determine. Consult your good rock, bad rock. Uh, we can sort them. What is this uh, brochure? See, but we it's so a, different uh, on land. <laughs> you can see here, um, for our viewers right there, there is a good rock, bad rock pamphlet here that... Um, I definitely want to see this. ...helps, uh, uh, help us distinguish. Yes. I think we need to turn this into a kid's book. <laughs> <laughs> good rock. Isn't there, isn't there two? Bad rock. One that explains the good rocks and then one that explains the bad rocks. I like it. There's it's like two. good rock, bad rock, yeah. big rock, small rock. This is like exactly what is like so important to show people because it, you think like, oh, the geologists have this like really specific, very like obtuse, scientific, <laughs> jargony guide to rocks. And it's like literally says good rock, bad rock. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is Amber's creation. I credit, love it. credit is due. Uh, but I think it was really important for us to have the good rock, bad rock frame of, re frame of reference. Uh, but it turns out, no matter how good you think the rocks are, they <laughs> could just, just be... don't know. Just a bunch of mud. Yeah, it's got <laughs> yeah. to be like one of the Tricked us a couple morals times. of the story. Key to finding a good rock is to go up and punch it. <laughs> <laughs> We're good oh, at that. More rocks, more better. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is great. Thank you. <laughs> All we did, we saw a lot of crusts, so she's right, they are hard to locate. Front row, Nav, any highlights, takeaways from our dives that we've done so far? I really liked uh, our rock hunt. That's actually why the Good Rock, Bad Rock guide <laughs> made me so happy. <laughs> uh, it's, always, it's always nice to have like a very specific objective that everyone in the van and on shore can get behind. Um, and I feel like usually it's focused on biology so it was nice to have a, a geological uh, feature that we were all looking for. But agreed, it's always nice to have questions from our viewers, many of whom have been participating in our expeditions for many, many years um, alongside our scientists ashore who are so helpful in providing IDs and, and guidance on what we're seeing since we're a limited number out here, and it's pretty amazing to be able to bring so many people along with us, I'm sure. Agreed. Maybe there's a video game in there, like Rock Hunter. <laughs> a little scratch game we can make to, to simulate <laughs> the experience. So Jamie's been talking about this uh, Magic School Bus, like PC game from like the early 90s or something, where she believes you essentially just go and collect rocks. <laughs> so I need to look into that. That might exist. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting question. Do we stream on Twitch? I think the answer is no, but we stream on our website, Nautilus Live, and on YouTube. Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I got some confirmation. There have been some Twitch tests, but not uh, consistent yet. I feel like I'm showing my age when it comes to things like Twitch, where I'm just like, I kind of know what it is, That's but I don't. It's okay, I just learned about it last year, too. <laughs> Twitch I have TV. No idea what it is. It's a live stream. I don't know, I just know my, my, my kids are really into watching Twitch and watching video games, and then they also broadcast themselves 
playing video games on Twitch, which may or may not be legal because most things you have to be 18 years old. Now that I say that out loud, I'll look into that situation. <laughs> So someone says that we have won the uh, watch title name award for this expedition. Oh, oh. oh yeah. yes. As oh. well as the prior expedition back in November and December as well. I'm still not sure if any other watches on this cruise had a name. Uh, yeah, if you know of other watch names, please write them in the chat because we don't know about them, but. We Maybe. do talk to other people on other watches, we promise. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we have to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we go days and have two minute conversation in the van and that's it. <laughs> yeah, a couple minutes at meals. Yeah. Just a curious question for me. Do you ever um, descend or ascend with the lights off on the ROVs? Yeah, when we have the PAR sensor on there, we certainly do. It's looking for uh, light that we obviously can't see. And they, we Actually, there's some LEDs on the vehicle. We tape all those off, so it's like complete darkness. Yeah, video doesn't like it unless it's necessary. No, none, <laughs> of us, none of us like it. It's like totally relying on your instruments. Even yeah. though you can't see anything but blue, it's, you know, black is not a lot different. I know. You get a sense of the things going <laughs> by. I just threw that out there because I had to tell the students that it's it's actually, you can't see anything out there. It's black. <laughs> yeah, we can effectively see like two meters. Kind of like being in your car at night, I guess. Can't even see that far. Be a song. When the lights go out on the ROV. <laughs> they got some spectacular images with Mesobot last year. Yeah? Yeah. The Dusk and dawn. Yeah, dusk and dawn, twilight zone. But I was surprised that they could see things at like three to five hundred meters. Wow. You see little. Was it a low light camera? Uh, no, I'm not sure, but they had some specialized instrumentation on there. They could detect. Uh, what were they looking at, Steve? Some kind of critters. Mesobot? Yeah, migrating through the water. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't there, but I would imagine it's probably fish or crustaceans Maybe that live in the like deep scattering layer. Some kind of crab? Huh. I, no. I, think, uh, I think Megan was there. Yeah. They were, they were in the water column, right? Not, not plankton, but you know, high concentrations of some very small animal that comes up and goes down during the twilight. So for the folks at home, the Musobot is a autonomous vehicle uh, that's operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And Musobot will actually be back out on Nautilus uh, this year in May. Uh, we'll have a few vehicles out for a technology integration through the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute which is a NOAA ocean exploration funded uh, initiative that Nautilus is part of. Um, so we'll be having partners out from Woods Hole bringing out uh, the autonomous vehicle Mesobot, as well as the hybrid remotely operated vehicle Nereid Under Ice, the new vehicle, um, which as the name suggests, it usually operates under sea ice conditions, um, but is also 
going through testing to um, we're, we're bringing actually three vehicles out, so let me step back. Mesobot, Near Under Ice, Nui, and the Drix, which is a University of New Hampshire um, operated vehicle that is a surface vehicle that can do a shallow water mapping. So the goal is to have three vehicles out at once and um, kind of iterate on being able to launch uh, multiple vehicles throughout a 24 hour operating period with the eventual goal of potentially being able to run them simultaneously. Uh, to maximize operational time at sea. Ooh, great jelly. Helmet jelly. Is this the same jelly that was seen earlier in the cruise that went famous, got a little viral? You can do a 4K zoom in it. Hmm. Nope. Not anymore. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, so if you are watching our expeditions, it'll be after our next uh, ROV expedition. Um, it'll look a lot different though. All of the vehicles um, are autonomous, so they don't have that uh, cable back to the ship, so they also don't have the real-time video feeds. Although now that I say that, I think Nui might have one iteration which does involve a tether. Um, it does? Yeah, and I don't know if they're deploying it on this cruise. So uh, if you're watching our expeditions um, in May, it'll look a little different. They'll be mostly topside cameras uh, with potentially some views into the control van where you'll see three operational teams set up um, as well as the wet lab and the ROV hangar will look a lot different as all four of our ROVs will be uh, dockside for that expedition. Where do you put three ROVs? Does Herc and Argus stay on board? No, so all, all four ROVs are off, uh, will be off the ship and then the three uh, autonomous vehicles will be on the back deck. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. Trix is, will be on the starboard side as we had during shakedown. Um, I think Nui ends up going into the hangar at some point. It sits on Lisa the tracks that? just yeah. outside the hangar. Yeah. The inside of the hangar is their workspace. Yeah, they have they. Uh, they must have um, I, at least a dozen, probably closer to 18 Rockstar cases. So their mobile system, they bring everything. Rockstar cases. Yeah, the big uh, cases that musicians pack all their instruments and <laughs> amplifiers and gears in. Okay, that's what I thought you meant by Rockstar. That's <laughs> the you brand know, it was name. It's like an acronym or? No, it's the brand name. Really? Yeah. Oh, so it's like the music version of Pelican cases? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but not cool. waterproof. Well, yeah. They're, they're big. Necessarily. They're, they're, yeah, we have two Rockstar cases for our uh, monitors on the wall there. I want a Rockstar case. The, the ones for the wall, the big monitors, are actually Max Line custom made mm. in Portland, Oregon. Right. A lot of our camera cases and foam, because we're such a specialized setup, are custom made. But we do have some Rockstar cases that we use for some of the audio gear and everything when, if, when and if we ever have to transport it. Is that your fun pack for the day? <laughs> sure. <laughs> But they, um, they really populates the whole hangar there. They make a really nice, uh, it's kind of a, they have a horseshoe arrangement. It's kind of like your kitchen. So they have stuff all the way around with a big island in the middle. It's pretty impressive, the amount of stuff they bring and the time it takes them to set up. Is they're busy, very busy crew. We gotta get all of our stuff out of here because they come in here and just take over. <laughs> I just noticed that box up there that says waiting for sensor. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a Easter egg. running joke. Nobody really knows. <laughs> That's all I get. <laughs> I, I put it up there. Um, I think we're still waiting for sensor. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really never been used? Has it really never been used? It's an R it's for the ROVs. That's all I know. And I I was just told make sure when you sit in the Herc seat you can read it. <laughs> <laughs> did, did it come over from the old vans? Oh yeah, most definitely. Yeah, so it's been waiting now for a very long time. <laughs> a couple <of> years. <laughs> 
thought I recognized it. Things you start to notice on Blue Water Watch. <laughs> I think it was an old uh, load cell, it, it, or it's uh, for the um, the other winch that's on the deck there, the winch that's on the social deck. Hmm. It's uh, it might be a line counter and or a load cell for that. I've only ever used that once before. That winch. Uh, it gets used on. Uh, ONC quite a bit. ONC, you said? Yeah. Yeah. It's super cool, actually, now where you guys remounted your uh, cam starboard because you can turn around and actually look at that winch. So there's a remote here under my feet for it. But Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask another question. How, how new is the new van and how old is the old van? This van was uh, completed in 2020. And it's actually three vans or cargo containers put together that they can operate. You can operate with just the van, one van where all the front row is, where nav, ROV, and video is. But you can't, you need the, the front van to be able to use the other two but you can go just one and two or you can do one two and three or just one and the whole system is meant to be mobile so we could pack it all up and ship it to wherever it may need to be and then uh, install install it on another vessel if needed however I do not know when or if that will Just nice. Another, and is this uh, the second iteration of the control van, or has there been more? Well, of this style of being mobile, in this effect, this is the first. Oh, okay. Of nice. Of this particular, for Nautilus. The old vans were about half the size. I mean, Antonella, in the old van, Antonella and I would be like, resting our head on each other's shoulders, and you would be trapped in the corner be behind me <laughs> and unable to get out unless I moved. The SCF position was the short, st short straw, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Had a, like a air conditioning blowing down on you. Yeah, sometimes dripping down on you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Now you, enough comes briefly. You would like have to wear, it gets so cold in that van, you'd have to wear like winter clothing and bundle up. You'd actually huddle up to the computer monitors to keep to warm. To try and keep warm. <laughs> That's the only thing that gave off heat. Yeah. It was a little leaky, yeah. I don't know how old or how long those ones have been on. That's They were there since before my time. Circa turn of the century. <laughs> Y2K. Sounds right. <laughs> and it was only two, two containers. And I think they were smaller than this. Uh, they were the same uh, 8 by 20 size. They just didn't look as big because the, there was only one archway cut out between the two. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't fully cut out because we had the half the wall for the monitors for the science row. Yeah. So which were tiny compared to these ones. Well, I mean the actual frame size was larger, wasn't it? Individually. No, they were eight by twenties. Standard. Oh you mean in the front row? I thought you meant the back row ones. Oh the monitors? The back row monitors were much bigger. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Well there was one on the wall there, right? Yeah. Uh bigger than what? The, the back row monitor, the TVs in the back row were bigger than one of these frames on the wall up here. Absolutely not. Really? Really. Huh. They were... Actually, in your room is one of the old ones. No, 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 no. The, the, in the science row, mm -hmm. there were like two massive uh -huh. screen TVs. Uh-huh. They, yeah. weren't, they weren't the one in the room. They were the ones on the wall, you mean? Yeah, the ones yeah. on the wall. Yeah. 
They definitely weren't bigger than these. These are the biggest monitors we had, special ordered. These are broadcast wall monitors. I think we might be talking about two different monitors. You're talking about the two monitors that were in the back behind on the wall for the science row. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there huh. was a 60 incher there for a while, a 4K one. But it was only there, uh, I think it was there the last year or so of the band. Is there one or two big ones? They upgraded them, Tammy, not long before the band demo. Brand new 4K monitor. I think it was broken. One of them is uh, stuck with magnets in the shop in San Pedro. <laughs> Playing highlight video over and over for all the customers that come through there. That might be the 4K one then. No, I, don't I know think so. one of the big monitors, some something in transit or something, I think broke. or had a defect. Now I can only make uh, 13 and change. Given or else he's called Captain. Uh-huh. <laughs> What's the time? 57? Yeah. Roger. This happens to me all the time. I get optimistic and then uh, we hit some kind of I have a question. Have y'all used mini Hercules this season yet? Yeah, we tested little Hercules and Atalanta, which is essentially a smaller Argus uh, during our shakedown cruise, which was the week before this expedition started. Actually, the 10 days before this expedition started. And uh, that was quite a deep dive. 30 Five, hundred meters, yeah. Like it was impressive. We, uh, Little Hercules have been in a crate and shipped uh, all over the continental U.S. and then over to Hawaii and took it out of its crate, put it together and ran it down to 3,500 meters. <laughs> when would you use them over Argus and regular size Herc? Uh, it was meant to be a mobi mobile system. Um, there's actually a separate um, van for it, a tool van and some other support, topside support stuff. Yeah, they're currently on board as uh, backup vehicles for our ROV season. But so far, knock on wood, they are just here for backup. But uh, Little Hercules is just an imaging vehicle. There aren't uh, collection boxes on board, and there's not a manipulator arm, so it's just for just for collecting video imagery. Gotcha. But it can take the uh, the 4K, or it can actually fit the Zeus camera, which is amazing for a thousand pound vehicle. To have such a huge camera on it. Just can't grab anything. Mm -hmm. No, it needs a grabber. Mm. It's an electrical grabber. There's no hydraulic power unit on it, so the thrusters are electrical, the same kind of thrusters that are on Argus. Mm. But most of the uh, manipulators out there are uh, hydraulically powered. Electric ones are more for the uh, kind of the drone and blue blue ROV kind of size stuff. Although there is a company out of uh, somewhere in the, the Netherlands building a that size electrical manipulator we've been looking at. Two more meters 
a minute. I kind of get it. <laughs> up so many rocks. Crap valve is off, right? Yeah. I think Bob's theory about the warmer water being less buoyant is... I always thought it was the other way around. The what? Robert's experience in Alvin, when it comes up and you get into the warmer, less dense water, you, you know, there's less flotation on the vehicle. And I always thought that the more pressure you had, that the uh, syntactic foam would get a little smaller and has less flotation properties. But mm. it's been an ongoing discussion. But it's hard to argue with a guy that spent 20 years in a man sub. He said, "Well, come up and actually hit the warm water and stop, like you hit a." Huh. It happens. Ceiling. Free diving too. Oh, yeah. Or no, you don't stop, stop, but there's a, like a, you get pulled down after a certain point. Interesting. Yeah. So, in hindsight, we should have took that high speed while we can. And you know what they say? That's that one still. We'll be on time. We'll be close. Ten till. Yeah. Hindsight is twenty twenty two. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the year. So I usually take whatever we can get, and then that last. What's the water temperature now? What's yeah, it's come from four degrees to six and a half. Does this syntactic foam undergo significant compression? Like it should no, keep it shaped. No, I don't think so. Okay. If you were it does move around a little. I, I think it depends on the construction of it, how dense it is. Mm. Operating some vehicles where it gets loose enough to rattle at depth. I think it's tight oh, wow. on deck, and that's why we use the Belleville washers on, on mm -hmm. the top and then rubber on the bottom so it stays attached to the vehicle. Mm. But I think it depends on the uh, shape of the Fantastic foam and the manufacturing. Mm. How dense it is, how much spheres versus epoxies in it. Gotcha. So we're getting kind of close to 500. Um, we just run briefly through uh, the new recovery. Not new recovery, but slightly modified recovery. Uh, we'll still track forward at one to two knots uh, when we get to 500 meters. Roger. Um, increased streaming speed if Herc's not lined up the ship as we move to 300 meters. Um, same for 200 up to three knots. And that's also when the note here is that Herc may go into bypass as we're passing through the thermocline. Uh, 100 meters will inform all stations if Herc is off to one side and the pilots are not able to thrust to come in line if you've gone into bypass. 50 meters will inform the deck if Herc will remain in bypass or is unable to drive to the end of tether. At 10 meters, we'll request the ship to reduce thrust. And on the surface, once Herc is on the crane, we'll request a slow decrease in ship speed unless the deck's already called up that request. All right. Any additional? Uh, oh, there's also a note here that we need to compare Grafana to the winch readout. There may be a difference for the 10-meter uh, call. Probably in this weather, we can probably, um, once Argus is on deck, we can hold position. See how it looks. OK. Not, not slow down. Yeah, typically the original procedure is you hold position once Argus is on deck. And the reason not to keep going forward through the water is 
we have these big swells plus the drag on yeah Kirk is uh, it's tugging Argus around pretty good on deck. It will depend on the surface current. But if we're, yeah, if we're pushing the weather window, you got both the current and the wind on that right on the bow. Yeah. And but then... What's um, the readout for current now? Current is 1.6. Yeah, so you're, you're already doing, if you believe that, even half of that is right. So you got a over half a half an out head window already. Yeah. Looks like it has been spiking up to 22, but What's that? It looks like it has the wind also has been spiking up, um, but we'll see what it looks like. Just recently started picking up in the last. Uh, hour ish. Roger, thanks data lab. Yeah, that's historically why Randy doesn't like to start streaming early because he watches that current like a, he's got so a on that. Wind. We have yeah, a question of, uh, uh, do we ever send decorated styrofoam cups down with Herc and watch them shrink? On camera. Not on Herc, we've done that on some other systems. I was talking about uh, sacrificing one of Argus's cameras to put them on the cups. That's really entertaining to watch. Especially if you put it to music. <laughs> we actually do have a video of um, cups going down on Herc from oh like yeah. 2013, maybe. Um, oh it's on the website if you look for. I'm not even sure what the keywords anymore. Probably styrofoam cup. <laughs> um, yeah, it was. Uh, I think part of a National Geographic expedition because I think the logo is in there too. There it is. Just go to knowledgelive.org and type in cup in the search bar. And is that a video <laughs> or that's the, that's the blog. a blog? There's an animation or graphic. Yeah, there's a time lapse video. Nice. Really? I haven't seen that. I've been all over that website. When you read when you uh, redesign a website from the ground up, you discover a lot of things that you didn't know was there. <laughs> I'll tell you that. A lot of things Can that were hidden. See something real quick. Right oh yeah. Interesting. But they still come up. She's one of my students. So. Oh, currently. No. Oh. Like Ten or fifteen years ago. What did she do? Boom, and that just happened. We went from 13 to 19. Oh my goodness. Hmm. Yeah. You can speed up. Sweet. Please.
Mexico. And that's got to be kind of a cool, satisfactory sort of feeling, <laughs> right? <laughs> and just discovered that uh, one of Dijana's former students. Yes, was an ocean science communication fellow in 2016. Cool. Awesome. waiting to see when we get closer to 700, 900 feet, because I think that's one of the deepest free diving dives that a human's done. But I can barely go down 10 feet in a pool. That person, I think, can hold their breath for nine minutes. Jeez. <laughs> That's such a wild skill to have. Right? Nine minutes? Are you kidding me? Like 90 seconds is pushing it for me. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 60 seconds. OK, RV, are we ready to start moving forward? We can wait till 500. But. Oh, you can go now. Oh, OK. Check and see where we're at. Might be up to speed by time we're at 500. Yeah. Oh, she's talking meters. Hmm. We still have a ways to go. Bridge, no? You know that every Christmas they uh we can start tracking a lot of forward. stations will like show the Yule log burning because uh, people have gone off to mm -hmm. we should do the blue law or the blue water, you know. Yeah. With some music. Yeah. Yeah. to look up Tool, listen to some of that music. Apparently they've been around since the 90s. Yeah, no, I've, uh, I mean, I've had the pleasure of seeing them twice live. It's really cool, and they always put on a fun show. Is it? What kind of music is it? You have, uh, Blue back there on your. Did I have that in the back row? Yes. Are you going to pull? Okay, yes, I do. <laughs> I guess I will have the opportunity to listen. Oh. I guess it's okay. I get it. Like Bruno.
fridge, no? Uh, secure tanks, enable air tuggers, and uh, let us know when the captain's on the bridge. Thank you. Looks like that was a nice sunset. So someone is asking what air tuckers are. Um, they are the, uh, I'm trying to think of a way to describe them that doesn't use the word air tuggers. Thank you. <laughs> it's like the, the poles with the rope on the top. <laughs> uh, yeah, air powered windshield. Sorry, Dan. Could you repeat that? I don't think you're on SPL. Sorry, they're um, they're air-powered winches that are mounted on pedestals on the deck. There, the orange guys, and um, there's two recovery hooks that are attached to the front of Argus while it's still at the water line. And then uh, when we lift Argus the several meters from the water line to deck level, um, those pull Argus in so they keep it from swinging. Okay. And they also kind of slide Argus across the deck as it, we kind of land it hanging half off the deck and then uh, Herc's tugging on it from the, uh, tugging on the aft part of it, Argus, and the, the air tuggers are tugging on the front part and that keeps it from swinging fore and aft as it comes into its uh, landing position. Okay. Now we have an answer. Yeah, someone asked, uh, it's like, I always ask and I haven't got an answer, so luckily we're able to give them an answer. Yeah, it's part of our checklist as uh, the vehicles are coming up, or actually before launch is asking the bridge to turn on the air to the tuggers, because we'll turn it off in between sometimes, so... Um, just on our on our nav checklist of things that we make sure are ready to go. Go ahead, Bridge. Roger, thank you. They're turned off as a safety measure so they can't be inadvertently energized while they're uh, not being operated. The covers are on them. They make about uh, close to a thousand pounds of force each one and a 17,000 pound uh, line attached to them. Spectra, fancy braided uh, 
synthetic line. Someone else asked, at what depth do we see sharks? And I suppose at any depth we can see sharks, really. Um, the last time we saw the oceanic white tips was right near the surface when we were recovering. I know, I know. <laughs> no, but they weren't responding to me or the thing. Were there people over there? Oh, done. Camera works. I think I can take starboard all the way around. What do you think about uh, increasing speed? One and a half? Okay. Moment. That's enough in the goalpost. Yeah. If it starts swinging any more to the south, we'll bump it up. Water is still pretty cold. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter. Whatever makes you happy. There. I know how far Argus is from her now. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that won't change. What's the tether right now, 30? Yeah. yeah. Well, actually 35 when they're tail to tail. 35. Depends on where you measure it. But we get the length of Argus in the bank when they're tail to tail. Steve, someone asked if this is the uh, when the next dive is. Is this our last dive of this leg of the expedition, or? Yeah, um, it looks like that's the case. Uh, so if we if we would, did want to try and sneak in a dive, <laughs> sneaky dive. <laughs> what we would have like to do is descend right now. <laughs> <laughs> Not tear the vehicles apart when we. Yeah, get pretty much turn on the main engines immediately. Uh, on recovering and then zoom back down to Kingman, which is 10 hours. We can get in the water for about a uh, four or five hour dive and then we can get up and then <laughs> that's about it. We should do it. Before the weather starts to turn. Wouldn't Why that just be it? us descending to the bottom and, and like then going four right back hours. up? Well, I mean, it depends so on the depth. we would do a shallow dive. Yeah. Uh -huh. Don't tempt me. <laughs> I'll sounds, do it. That sounds much more fun than maintenance. That's no rocks, probably within the depth range capable. But you'd, be able, you'd have to do that and then pretty much just go straight back to uh, shore. What are some there of the constraints no that you're looking at? Weather constraints? Yeah. Yeah, mostly weather. But there's also time, I mean, it, and comfort. Um, you know, we're going to be beating up into the, you know, not the nicest seas for about three or four days straight. So mm -hmm. why prolong it? We're already 10 hours closer to Honolulu than going back to Kingman. So uh, we do have some mapping targets we're going to hit. Um, we kind of didn't do much mapping uh, during this expedition. I had allotted, so if we had done it as planned and we had great weather, 
we would have mapped each site for about five or six hours before a dive and then dove. Um, but just the, the way it worked out uh, with the weather and everything um, ended up having to be more dive, less map, uh, since those were the higher priority uh, activities. We did a lot of mapping just in transit. Yeah, yeah. So most of the mapping was in transit and we'll be doing some more mapping in transit. <laughs> uh, depending the on the data time. quality, <laughs> depending on the data yeah. quality, of course. So does weather impact mapping operations? It sure does. It definitely does. Uh, mm -hmm. Depending on which direction you're going, um, you can have dropouts uh, if the seas are too rough and the uh, seafloor just disappears. And then there's there's a point where, you know, usually we do XBTs or UCTDs and if the deck is that unsafe, um, we have other ways to getting sound speed profiles, but you know those are the best quality. To get the best quality data, you still want to be able to do those. And uh, it's not not pleasant to be out on the back deck when it's 10, 11 foot seas. <laughs> Ooh, have you done that? Ouch. I don't think so. Okay. I don't know, have we done that on the way down? Probably. What was the question? Have we, have, do we do XBTs during the weather on the way down? Uh, we definitely did XBTs on not great weather days, but if it's overnight and also poor weather, we usually just use uh, World Ocean Atlas or other yeah. other sources. But if it's poor weather during the day, we'll sometimes slow the ship down. Or it'll already be slow because for weather. Yeah. Looks like we're getting a wind spike again. When I started as an ocean science intern, we were the watchstanders, the science process, sample processors, and the mappers. Ouch. <laughs> All on the same boat. Uh, we're doing triple duty. And it was amazing. It was so fun. That's lots of jobs for one person. It was a lot of jobs, yeah. We had we had, we were lucky to have a mapping department now that coordinates that much higher pro quality product too. Go ahead, Bridge. Roger, thank you. We'll switch to radio. So there are some people earlier asking about like how you know you can get aboard one of these explorations, and and I was hoping maybe Rebecca you could talk a little bit about how you know you got a, you know your journey to come aboard Nautilus and kind of things that you did? Yeah, so um, I, like I said earlier in the dive, if you weren't with us, I'm a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. Um, and part of our requirements for graduation is to go on at least one cruise of five consecutive nights. Um, so people are always looking around um, for opportunities. Um, so Dwight Coleman, who's one of the lead scientists ashore for this expedition, was looking for two extra geologists to go on this cruise um, and approached my advisor um, with that opportunity. And so she told Corley Rodriguez and I about this opportunity in early February um, and just had us get in touch with Dwight if we wanted to go, and here we are. So very quick turnaround. Um, I know other peers of mine have, uh, you know, gotten an opportunity to go on a cruise and left like the next day kind of deal. Wow. So it can, it can work pretty quickly. Cool. Yeah. What about you, Dejana? Pure luck. 
pure luck. <laughs> Just really, really lucky and honored to be asked to serve as a science communication fellow for this leg of the expedition. <laughs> and you? Uh, because they were diving within the Pacific Rim Island Marine National Monuments, um, certain permits had to be um, filled out in order to take samples from the monuments, um, which are co-managed by you know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as you know, NOAA. Um, so it was just kind of a great opportunity to come out here and see the work and the science that's been done, um, and then also help further the message of why you know, these remote, these monument, these marine national monuments are so important. Awesome. What is the deepest you said for free diving? Uh, it said between 700 and 800 feet. Current world record for free diving. That's a human holding their breath and going to those depths and coming back. It's a very dangerous sport. Yeah. Do they have to take the same sort of measures when they come up as like scuba divers have to do? Oh, that's a great question. They don't because they're not breathing compressed air. Mm. So they just take air at the surface, hold it, and come back up. So they're not expanding their lungs any bigger. Where a scuba diver is constantly breathing underwater compressed air. So if they were to come up too quickly, the volume of air increases as pressure decreases. So you could have you could have a problem. wait to see the styrofoam cups in addition to our biological and geological samples that we'll be retrieving shortly when the vehicles are back on deck um, we also will be able to retrieve some styrofoam cups that we sent down with Argus that will also help demonstrate the impact that pressure has on air spaces at great depths Oh my gosh.
Looks like we're in our last half hour here before we start um, recovering the vehicles on deck. For those of you that are still with us, thank you for joining us for the Blue Water Watch. If you have any end of dive questions, our chat's still active, so go ahead and send your, your messages, your shout outs. Let us know where you're, where you're tuning in from. We love hearing from you all. I'm going to ask it. Steve, what are we looking at? Uh, <laughs> you really want to know? <laughs> uh, it's probably bits of squid ink um, and things. Huh. Things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A shark? Yeah, uh, animal detritus, let's say. So apparently there's a, been a shark spotted in uh, the Argus camera. And that's satellite feed too. All right. Oh, it was one of the tether cams? Okay. So it's not going out currently, but uh, keep an eye out. Oh, might, I see it. Be. Uh, you do? Yeah. So go to sea log. Where is it? It's, it's right up there by the... No. The tether cam that they... Like a oh, bowl. Oh, nice. Pyrosome. Yeah. Go ahead, Bridge. You want to drop down? Uh, stand by, Bridge. Okay, so keep. So we can keep at 1.5. Oh. Oh, Shark yeah, that's, one by. that's how the camera couple view. Of them. Yep. Yeah, a couple. Right in the Argus cam. Argus, uh. Tether. Yeah. yeah. Uh, stand by, Doug. Bigger. How do you mean? Like we'll uh, hold in the water? Five zero. Yeah, that's a lot of. I, I think just particulate matter. Some of it maybe from the vehicle. Some of it is probably just from the surrounding ocean. Lots of siphonophores and things. So there's a shout out from a fellow geolo geoscientist who says that they're listening. Uh, while they work on oceanography of the Red Sea, so. Very cool. Yeah, we're at point three now. Roger. Okay, so you're actively driving. You're actively driving. Okay. Okay. Not in bypass, so I don't need to inform deck. 
router. Okay. All stations, this is the winch coming up. Router winch. If you guys are going to come up, you let me know first, all right? Are we coming up? Deck, we are coming up from 5 zero. Like I said, you tell the deck first, don't tell the winch. Bridge, are we okay to recover? Uh, deck, bridge, bridges go. Yeah, yeah, you'll see. You have all sorts of, you know, depends on the time of day, really. You have all sorts of marine plankton and small fish. And, um, Go ahead, Bridge. The okay, speed now is at 1.45 and steady. Roger. Bridge nav, reduce thrust. Bridge, copy that. There's a shark um, in the hurt cam, or it was there, but.
Nav bridge, jet pump uh, restored to full power. Roger. You can slow down a little bit, you're pulling too hard on Kirk. Yeah, hey, Roger that. Deck bridge. Uh, I, okay, I've cut the power to, to five zero percent. If you, if you need more, just tell me. Roger that. This is looking good. Copy that. Then the skin bottle. Yeah, we didn't use that one. Shark. I don't think that was a white tip. Yeah. That is a different shark. Yeah, we're just going to be a second. We got a knot in the line. Roger. No idea. Nope. Different shark. Yeah, blue shark, shark or salmon shark, I think, are out here, too. I'm trying to remember what we saw a couple years ago. It's right at a half knot now.